left in the Luke series, and then we'll be launching another series sometime in October. So we're excited about that. So Luke chapter 20, it says, One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up, and they said to him, Tell us, by what authority do you do these things? Or who is it that gave you this authority? And he answered them, I will also ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why didn't you believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I speak. This passage is one of the most important in the whole Bible. I often overlooked it and uh, didn't understand how deep this thing was until I meditated on it this week. I love doing these series of teachings through a book of the Bible because I would have probably never preached on this message in my life had we not done this. And yet this message is so, so profound. Uh, and what Jesus is bringing out is, is amazing. And so what this is talking about and what I'm going to speak about today is the origins and limits of authority. The origins and limits of authority. Recognizing the origin and limits of authority actually facilitates a chain of command that creates relational, economic, and political boundaries and gives guidelines for submission and order. So I'm going to say that again. When we understand authority, authority creates and facilitates a chain of command that creates boundaries, and these boundaries show us the limits in politics, economics, uh, and all kinds of authority structures. So we have to have authority to understand the limits and boundaries of people, nations, and, and uh, localities. And so uh, when we look at what's going on in the world today, for example, for those of you who follow international politics and what's going on internationally, which all of you really should, should not live in a bubble, the least you could do is watch the 6.30 news somewhere, uh, one of the mainstream channels, and see at least what's going on the first 10 minutes. But right now we have uh, a big issue going on with North Korea, obviously. And they're violating a treaty that was done in 1992 where it was a non-nuclear proliferation treaty where the United States took all their nuclear weapons out of South Korea and uh, North Korea promised not to develop nuclear weapons. So now, when they're shooting ballistic mi missiles claiming that they have nuclear warheads, that is violating a boundary of authority that was put up in 1992. And uh, that's why the whole world is, is very upset. On another level, which can also become major in the future, is China in the China Seas began building islands. Can you imagine? We could now build islands. Uh, Dubai does that now because they ran out of real estate. And you could actually create islands in the sea, and they're creating islands in international waters, and they're putting military power on all these islands, and they're claiming the rights to the, to the China Sea, uh, which is in violation of boundaries and Japan, the Philippines, uh, and other nations in, in Asia are very, very upset. And the United States is constantly putting warships in the China Sea uh, in defiance to this, because if we didn't do that, then the whole world would subsume itself unto China. And there's all more than a trillion dollars of trade that go through the China Sea, so it's all about money. So there is uh, the issue of authority, out of that emanates boundaries, and out of that, we facilitate economic, political, and other social structures by which we submit to authority. When these boundaries are violated, a breach of boundaries could bring war. And we may be on the cusp of war right now. On a local level, we see authority uh, 
in, let's say, the, uh, the NYPD, in the New York City Police Department, for example. A police officer has authority to go into the middle of the street, put his hand up, and stop a truck from going down the block, correct? Now, if the truck decided not to stop uh, and kill the officer or, or uh, attempt to murder that officer, that officer, although he doesn't have the power, now this is where you gotta understand the difference between authority and power. He doesn't have the power to stop the truck, but the truck, if it had wisdom, the driver of the truck would stop because he re, uh, respects the power behind the uniform, which is over 30,000 police officers with all of their weaponry. All right, so yeah, he could run over that police officer, but yet he's gonna pay the price because of all the other police officers that back him up and the power of the state for that matter. And so we also understand that authority means nothing if you don't have the power to back it up. So North Korea is, is putting out all these threats uh, and the United States is going to test their power because they're claiming the authority to do something. Now hopefully it doesn't come down to uh, a war, which will not benefit anybody. And so we see that this passage is so important because they are challenging the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the limits of his authority would be based upon the power backing him up. And as we see here, the basic question is, did his authority come from men or did it come from heaven? And so let's go back to the first verse again. It says, one day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you were doing these things. Tell us by what authority you were doing these things. Quite amazing question. Um, and so the chief priests who said to Jesus, tell us by what authority you were doing these things, they represented the religious order, the old religious order of authority that Jesus was challenging. And so they had a structure, a political, economic, and social structure that they were protecting. And so Jesus was challenging their structure. And as we look back, we see that God was beginning to shake up the old religious order and the old religious system that these religious leaders represented. So you have the elders, you have the scribes who are the lawyers, the experts in the law, you have the Pharisees, they were uh, another part of the ruling power of Israel, and they were very, very vexed. They were upset at the ministry of Jesus because he was challenging their order. And, uh, and God was shaking and shifting the system away from the Levitical priesthood of animal sacrifices and circumcision and rituals and the temple. He was shifting it away from that towards uh, something that Jesus represented, which he called the new covenant. Somebody say new covenant. New covenant. And so the old covenant was transitioning out was vanishing away with its laws, with its rituals, and its stipulations. Uh, and Jesus was bringing a new covenant that was summarized in what he called the gospel, the good news. Because the old covenant was something that was putting burdens on them that nobody was able to bear. So he was bringing the good news of salvation through himself as the Messiah. But... What we had to understand as we move forward, the number one question was, did Jesus have the authority to do this? So you think that this is not a big deal because we're looking back 2,000 years after Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple destroyed. But can you imagine if you were living in that time? That would be the number one question you had. That's why this is so profound. This is a foundational uh, portion of scripture 
that almost holds up the rest of the whole New Testament. Just this portion here. Did Jesus have the right to do what he was doing? The question was, who had the authority? The old religious God represented by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the elders? Or did Jesus have the authority represented by what he claimed was his authority from the Father? You see, these Pharisees had thousands of years behind them. They had an institutional system supported by politics, supported by power, supported by economics. And when you think of institutional power, man, that's pretty impressive. Matter of fact, many of the denominational churches have institutional power. And it could look very easily like because they have so much money, so much real estate, so much wealth, so much prestige, so many titles, uh, so much of a hierarchy, uh, hierarchy and uh, bureaucracy, because they have this hierarchical power, you would think that God was with them. You would think that God really planned for them to be in power, planned for them to speak for him. But we have to understand that just because you have a large church, just because you have a lot of money, just because you have a lot of real estate, just because you have a lot of political power, just because you have a lot of titles, just because you have hierarchical power, just because you have a history, doesn't mean God is with you. That's what this is showing that's so astonishing. This is why just because a church has institutional clout doesn't mean they're from God. Right. They might have started off right. Doesn't mean they're in the right place now. Doesn't mean they're heading towards the right place. So this question had to be answered. Who had the right? The old religious order or the Lord Jesus Christ? And who, this is the second question. This is the question they, they brought to him, to Jesus, was who gave you the right to do what you are doing? Who gave you the authority? Now, if Jesus could not answer this question, if Jesus could not verify or validate the authority the Father gave him, then his whole ministry would have went down the tubes. The whole thing would have failed. We would have no death, burial, resurrection. We'd have no gospel. That's how important this is. And why is that? Because if he couldn't verify and validate that the Father sent him, who supersedes all institutional power, then he was self-appointed. Self-appointed leaders never last long. Self-appointed preachers do not represent God. That's why it tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 15, so important. When it comes to preaching the gospel, Paul says, how can they preach unless they are sent? We just look at the preaching, the power, uh, even, you know, the size of the church. God says, were you sent or you just went? If you just went, you do not have heavenly authority to preach the gospel, especially not to start a church. And so if Jesus was self-appointed, if he cannot, could not validate the fact that the Father sent him, that God was behind him, the whole thing would have went under. That's why this portion of scripture is so important. Uh, but if Jesus had the authority from heaven to preach the gospel, then the religious leaders lose all their influence all their power, all their authority, and they understood how weighty this issue was. How many understand what I'm saying here? And so this is what Jesus answered them when they said, who gave you this authority? He says, I'll also ask you a question. He's so witty. He very rarely answered questions directly, only a few times in Scripture. Most of the time, he followed every question up with another and with another question. In other words, if you could answer that question, then you'll answer your own question. 
See, too many times we lecture, we try to dictate and tell people what is right, but if we would just learn how to ask questions, we would get people to understand the truth for themselves. So he said, I'm going to also ask you a question. Tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Wow, what a question. <laughs> Powerful. <laughs> this was so important. Was it from heaven or from men? And we're going to get into this a little bit more. And this was what the prophets of old dealt with all the time. Uh, this was not a new question. Was it from heaven or from men? Because this was the main criteria established to determine whether or not a prophet was from God, whether or not a teacher was from God. Uh, let's go to Jeremiah 23. By the way, Jeremiah chapter 23 is one of the most important chapters in the whole Bible. I keep pouring over that chapter. But just one portion of Jeremiah 23, verse 21 and 22, it says, God says through Jeremiah, I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people. If they would have just stopped and heard from God, spent time with God, stood in my counsel, then they would have turned them from the evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Furthermore, it says in verse 30, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from one another. <laughs> they plagiarize one another. They echo one another. They steal my words from one another. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare, Thus saith the Lord. Behold, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, declares the Lord, and who tell them and lead my people astray by their lies and by their recklessness. When I did not send them, I did not send them, I did not send them or charge them, so they do not profit this people at all, declares the Lord. You see, this was what was established as a criteria. That's why they said, was it from heaven or from men? That's why Jesus said, before I answer this question, you tell me, was John sent from heaven or from men? Uh, this was the criteria they used in the first century church as well. The religious leaders brought the apostles before them, set them before the council when they preached post-resurrection about the Christ. And the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name, the name of Jesus. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, listen to this, we must obey God rather than men. Yes, they knew the authority from Jesus came from heaven. And even though these people had all the politics, had all the money, had all the real estate, had the temple, had the traditions, had the years of history, they no longer represented heaven. They only represented man. That's why it's so important for every church, for every generation, to stay on the cutting edge of what the Holy Ghost is doing and saying, because then God could say to us, you're no longer representing heaven, but you're now representing your own traditions. Christianity is always one generation away from extinction. Resurrection Church is one generation away from being no more. 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now, we might become a mosque, we might become a development, uh, or we might become just the ground of uh, some kind of other thing, maybe a movie theater, I don't know. But I believe uh, that God has called us to repair the next generation. I believe that God has called us to be on the cutting edge of what he's saying and doing. I believe that God has called us to be a church of fasting and prayer. A church that is declaring the word of the Lord so that we can always pass down the torch to everyone who comes. And we never rest in our laurels of money, of having a big property, of having a history, of having leaders, of being established, of having a reputation. We should never rest on that. As a matter of fact, Jesus said to the church of Sardis in Revelation chapter 2, he said, I know that you have a reputation, that you are alive, but you are dead. I don't care what our reputation is. If we are not continually seeking God, then we're dead. We no longer represent God, we represent man. 
And so Peter and the apostles said, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus. In other words, that's the validating point. That's what proved Jesus was from heaven. He was raised from the dead. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. The old order killed the new order. That can happen today. The old order always tries to kill the new order if they see it's a threat, if they're not careful. So they hung him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel, forgiveness of sins. Listen to this. We are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So we, as Resurrection Church, are continuing uh, the tradition, the apostles, who say we are witnesses of his resurrection. So when the council, the religious leaders, heard this, they were enraged. He wanted to kill them. You always know when you're speaking the truth when people get enraged. You know you're pushing someone's button when they're enraged. You know you're hitting a nerve of unresolved issues when people are enraged. And so they're enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to the men of Israel, listen to this, Using the criteria that Jeremiah talked about, he said, take care what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, Thutis raised up, claiming to be someone in a number of men, about 400 joined him. He was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men. This is the Pharisee warning his Pharisee friends, keep away from the apostles and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of men, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And so we see the criteria. If it is of God, nothing is going to stop it. I was watching a, a special about Adolf Hitler the last two weeks, just studying about it, and I couldn't believe the millions and millions and millions of people that were mesmerized, mesmerized by his speeches and by his leadership. But yet, he was of the evil one, not of God. It's incredible how people can be deceived. And Everything he worked for and fought for went to nothing, and he wound up committing suicide uh, in the mid-1940s after all of that work and acclaim. And so then Jesus said, tell me, is it John's baptism from heaven or from men? And verse 5 says, they discussed it with one another, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why didn't you believe him? <laughs> I love this. But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death because they are convinced that John was a prophet. Jesus was so smart. Unbelievably smart. Again, he asked the right question because he knew that if they received John, they had to receive him because John had delegated authority from Jesus to do what he was doing. You see that? John pointed to Jesus. John said, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoelaces. He said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. John was there to prepare the way for Jesus. So if they couldn't refute John, they couldn't refute him, Jesus. And so Jesus used that as an example. And he basically said, why didn't you believe him? In other words, if he's from heaven, why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you submit to his authority? Why don't you believe me? And, uh, and so verse 7 says, well, we don't know where John's authority came from. Jesus said, did his authority come from heaven or from men? They answered, well, we don't know where it came from. Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you what authority I do these things. Why? Because if you don't receive the one he sent, you don't receive him. Amen. 
It's a waste of time. If you can't receive the authority that a leader delegated, then you can't receive the leader. It'd be like if the ambassador of the United States went to China and the Chinese threw him out, why would the president then try to talk to them? They rejected the ambassador who represented the president, who represented the nation, then they're not going to uh, receive the president. And so Jesus here puts his delegated authority on the same level as his authority because both are emanating from the Father. Do you understand what I just said? Yes. Now, hold on to your seat. I wish I had time. I would read all this. But you look in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 12. John was on the island of Patmos, persecuted for the word of God. And he heard a voice. And the voice of Jesus came to him. And it says in verse 12, I have to skip the context for time. He says, when I turned to see the voice, that's an interesting statement, to see a voice. I turned to see the voice of him who spoke to me. When I turned, what was the first thing he saw? He saw the church. It says, when I turned to look, Revelation 1.12, check it out. When I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, I looked and I saw the seven golden candlesticks. The candlesticks, the end of the chapter, is the church. Each of them represented a church in the city. The church is the visible representation of the invisible God. We have the delegated authority from none other than God himself to preach the gospel, to represent Jesus. I just hit you with a bomb here. Did you hear that? That's why it says in Revelation 22... When he's talking about for him who is thirsty, him who is weary, let him come. He says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit, the Holy Spirit and the church say, come. The church is the main ingredient, the main authority on the earth that God uses to bring the lost in. It's not just the Holy Spirit, it's the church. If you try to do something by the power of the Holy Spirit, yet you don't do it through the church, you're wasting your time, even if there's some fruit. It's the Spirit and the bride that say, come. Look it up, Revelation 22. And so God has delegated his authority to the church. Let's go to Luke chapter 9. Authority and power. Oh, I'm happy preaching this stuff. In Luke 9, it says that Jesus called the 12 together and gave them power and authority. Somebody say power and authority. The police officer has authority, but he doesn't have all the power of the NYPD residing in him in his own person. He just has a gun and a weapon, but he doesn't have what 30,000 men and women have. It says here that God has given his disciples power and authority. Not only do we have the authority, but we have the power to back up the authority. Did you hear what I just said? He says... He gave them power and authority over all, not some, all demons Amen. and to cure diseases. Amen. See, this is one of the validating proofs that Jesus rose from the dead that we can cast out demons. You can't cast out demons in the name of Buddha. You can't cast out demons in the name of Muhammad. You can't cast out demons in the name of uh, uh, a president of a nation. But you could cast out demons in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because that is the validating proof that God rose him from the dead. The gospel is all about bearing witness to that. And so he gave them authority not only over demons but to cure diseases. To see people healed is a normal thing in scripture. And it says, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. That's the rule of God from heaven. And to heal. 
And they departed and went through the villages preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Healing everywhere. Someone say healing everywhere. Healing, healing is the children's bread. Healing should be the norm. Healing is a demonstration of the proof of the resurrection of Christ. Healing is something that cannot be separated from the preaching of the gospel. How about the next chapter, chapter 10? After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. And sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, verse 8, eat what is set before you. Listen to this. Heal the sick that is in them. So you're not just to eat. Your dessert is to heal the sick, to cast out devils, to bring God's peace and power to that realm. Never leave a friend's house without praying. Never leave someone's house without bringing the power of God down, the presence of God down. Never leave someone's house without giving room to the Holy Ghost to move and to speak in your midst. So he said, after you have a meal, heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day, for, on that day of judgment for Sodom than for that town. He gave them so much authority to represent him that if a town rejected one of his followers, they rejected him and they would be under the judgment of God like Sodom and Gomorrah was. If they reject the church, they reject him. If they reject the prophet of God, they reject him. Whole nations have fallen into disarray, fragmentation, immorality, and judgment because they have not taken heed to the word of the Lord that's come through prophets and apostles and the church. Jesus said if they reject his word, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment than it was for Sodom. And you know what happened to Sodom? Just look at Genesis chapter 18 and 19. And then it says, this is the whole gist of what he is bringing out. The one who hears you, hears me. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. When you lay hands on somebody, it's like Jesus is laying hands on Hallelujah. you. When you're casting out devils in the name of Jesus, it's because you have his name. Is authority. You have the right to preach, to heal, to set at liberty those who are bruised, to preach the gospel to the oppressed, and to bring peace to people's houses, communities, whole cities. Man, he says, the one who hears you hears me, the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. What is the result of what he did by sending them out? Verse 17. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are submitting to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What does that mean? That means that when they went out preaching the gospel, the powers of darkness that were in the atmosphere fell. It's a metaphor, Satan falling like lightning from heaven. It talks about Ephesians 2, that, that the prince of the power of the air. It's not talking about Pluto and the third heaven. It's talking about this atmosphere. The prince of the power of the air, the devil, operates in the sons of disobedience. So when they went out proclaiming the kingdom of God and healing the sick in every town and every city, Jesus saw the powers of darkness fall, lose their power and authority. They were displaced. That's what we need to do in every community. We saw this happen in this community when it was turned from a horrible state to something much better within 10 years. And we could see it happen in New York. We could see it happen in the nations and cities beyond New York. And so he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And why did Satan fall like lightning from heaven? Why is it that the demons submitted to them in the name of Jesus? Why is it when they went out two by two and meanwhile they were sent? They didn't just went. They were sent by God. Why is it when they were sent by God to proclaim the kingdom of God that Satan fell like lightning? Like lightning means he fell hard, 
fast and quick. It wasn't even a struggle. Why is it that Satan fell? He said, behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all, not over some, over all the power of the enemy. His power versus our power, no chance, no competition. It's not going 15 rounds with a decision made by two or three judges. It falls like lightning from heaven. Jesus already defeated Satan. And the only time Satan ever wins in your life is by deception. Not because he has the power. Not because he has the ability. Not because he can defeat you. Not because he has more power than Jesus. But because you believe a lie. He's a liar and the father of lies. He's a deceiver. He's an accuser of the brethren. You have more power than any power, including political power, institutional power, because the word of God says greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So he says, I've given you authority to tread on serpents. To tread and stamp on scorpions. Do a one-legged jump rope on them. And over all the power of the enemy and nothing. Not some things. Not occasionally. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing shall hurt you. Then he says, all right, calm down, boys. I know you're jumping, you're doing the jig, and you're all excited, and it is exciting. The first time you ever cast the devil out of somebody, it's amazing. But he said, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are submitting to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The greatest pleasure, the greatest joy that we have under heaven is that we're saved, that we're child, children of God, and we have access to heaven. And our names are written in the book of life. Let's all stand.